They've asserted authority as if they know so much more than everybody else. Uh, and they've established themselves as the rightful owner of this domain, the psyche or the mental illness department. Uh, and, and now the church is fighting to get back the authority that we always had. You, do you remember the little house on the prairie when people have problems, they went to see the pastor in the town. That's yeah. what it used to be, but <laughs> not now. Welcome to Tearing Down High Places. My name's Joe Gormley, and always there's something to laugh about. We've got a really fine guest today. Pastor Mike Jarrell has come come to us over the virtual river, and then uh, Pastor Jeff Clewer as well. So, Pastor Mike, how are you today? Very blessed, and you? Better than I deserve. Pastor Jeff, how are you? Better than I deserve. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So let's dig in, guys. Mike, Pastor Mike, can you can you just share a little bit about you and your church and uh, where, where are you coming from here? Sure. I've been a pastor for 40 plus years now. This is my third church. Been here uh, for 24 years in our 24th year. Uh, we're associated with the Evangelical Free Churches of America. We're in the far northeast of Philly, uh, almost out into Ben Salem and Feastville in that area. And I'm married and have two children. My son is also uh, in ministry out in Harrisburg area. My daughter is a neonatal uh, nurse practitioner, five grandchildren, and very, very blessed. That's great. And how'd you guys meet, Jeff? You and you and Mike, how'd you guys connect? Um, we have a cluster group of fellow pastors mm -hmm. from the Free Church. And we've been meeting, what, for like four years? Longer, longer than that, yeah. Yeah, for years and years. We meet at the diner and we talk theology and life and ministry and iron sharpens iron. So I, mm -hmm. I have learned a ton from this brother. That's why we invited him on. Wow. Wow. That is that is uh that's a big one because uh you are my go to. So that's great, Mike. You're you're uh, influencing my my uh my mentor here. So I'm so excited to, uh, to make your acquaintance. And, and we talked about a few possible subjects today. And honestly, mm -hmm. Jeff, I told, I told pastor Mike already, the one that got me the most excited was psychology, digging into psychology. And actually, so we have a Monday night men's group and they asked, you know, what, what books we might we look at, uh, for that. And I had suggested competent to counsel, which is Jay Adams first of I think a hundred books. Did he write a hundred books, Mike? You probably know. Um, pr probably close to it. Yeah. <laughs> so for the audience, Pastor, uh, Pastor, who is Jay Adams? Why do I bring him up? Uh, he's probably the pioneer in biblical counseling and in Christian circles, especially those of us who are evangelical and conservative. He saw long ago how the world was trying to strip away. Uh, from the church and from us pastors, the authority that we have in God's word and therefore our ability to help people. So little by little, they've been funneling people away from where they can get the best help. And that is in the spiritual life and mm -hmm. from scripture. So it's he, he saw that long ago and preached on it pretty hard. And uh, he's someone that I revere very highly. So would that be a good book for a men's study, the competent counselor, or is there some another one you might recommend? Uh, I think it is. I'm terrible at book names. But there's lots of good ones out there. Um, he, the the essence of that particular book is reminding us that the spirit filled Christian has more help, uh, more is more used of God to help you with your psychological issues than the unsaved expert with a dozen degrees um the the christian has what we need to please the lord to live a life that's that's pleasing to him and power filled and over able to overcome sin so why are we going to the secular world i don't know pastor pastor jeff you're training ministers right you want us all to have ministries right mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and notice that we don't send you to uh the local university to their psych department to learn how to do that <laughs> <laughs> we just open the scripture and believe that there's power in the word of God for transformation, which seems to be like so lost on our generation. One of the areas that I think about is like 
with the same sex attracted Christianity, Sam Albury and Preston Sprinkle and all of these uh, teachers are now saying that you'll always be gay as your identity, even after you get saved, as long as you don't practice it outwardly and, you know, physically, then um, then you're fine. But doesn't the word of God have the power to transform how we think, how we identify, like everything about us from the inside out? There's power in the spirit of the living God, in the word of God to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And mm -hmm. I think that's what biblical counseling does. Whatever the issue, that particular one or any other issue of sin in our lives, the power is in God mm -hmm. and he's given his word to instruct us. Right. So that's the bottom line for me. I agree. Yeah. How would you compare pastor Mike? How would you compare um, psychology's purpose versus biblical counseling's purpose? Uh, you're talking about secular psychology, I assume. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. Should I use a different term? I mean, how do I, I, you know, how do I do that? How do I speak about it properly as a Christian? Well, it, it, I you're saying it right, but we have to be careful because I even find myself many times we start talking and I'm narrowly thinking of the biblical counseling field and other people are thinking of the broader field. But even there, the word psychology and psychiatry, which was the staple for so many years now has, as the, as the world does, the secular left, they constantly are working on changing terms. So now it's mental illness. But psychology and psychiatry comes from psyche, which is a Greek word in our Bibles, where it tells us we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Our soul is our psyche. Uh, so psyche is originally a, a correct term. And I'm not, I don't have a problem with the mental word either. But, the, but why, why, did, why are they changing it? Why the emphasis on mental illness? And the reason is because they want to divorce it entirely from the spiritual aspect of man or the immaterial aspect of man because they are entirely Darwinian and materialistic and, and we're animals and that's it. So, so they're trying to strip it away and it's just a mental process and the problem is there. And then the illness, of course, is to emphasize you're a victim. We're all victims. Uh, mm. You can't help who you are. You can't help how you act. Uh, and therefore, we should let everybody out of prison and uh, so forth and so on. So <laughs> it just it, it has all these reverberations and ripple effect. But but that's the problem. So I don't have a problem with psyche. I don't have a problem with dealing with the mind. The Bible talks about that as well. Uh, but the, the thing is, they don't want to talk about the spirit. They there and, and I have a list of questions that I always encourage our people to ask. If you're going to go to a secular counselor and I can't stop you, I'm going to ask you to talk to them and ask them a, a certain number of things. Ooh. Is there such a thing as sin or evil? Uh, where does faith and Christianity, what role does that have to do in my spiritual life? And usually they see themselves as some kind of mental illness surgeons and the church is like a multivitamin. That's that's hmm. <laughs> that, that, that's how they see it. And I see it the opposite. I see it the entirely the other way around. Um, and and they are the, the founding fathers of psychology were almost all atheist or agnostic. Even the one uh, that's most championed as self-described as a Christian believed he was a little God. So that what kind of Christianity is that? Which one's and, that? Um, young. Yeah. Yeah. So these guys were way, way out there. And even to today, to today, I think it was uh, 2007 or so, I was brushing up on some of my notes uh, that they did a study of how many psychiatrists and psychologists uh, claim to be atheists today. And it's over 50% in some studies and well into the 30s and others. Uh, and, and it's stunning. They, they do not believe in God. They do not believe in the authority of scripture. They do not believe and the immaterial man uh, that, that were spirit and soul. Uh, they, they don't believe in eternity. So these are important questions to ask along with many others, but it's usually very interesting. They never talk about sin because there's no God to answer to. So therefore, what do they think about homosexuality or transgenderism? Now, why are we going to these people if they believe those things are normal and acceptable, which the American Psychiatric Association didn't used to believe were normal and acceptable. So were they right then or right now? Uh, and they've made major changes. 
And why are we going to them for expertise? If, if we can't trust them on those matters, uh, like a Supreme Court justice who doesn't know what a woman is, why are we listening to them for anything else? But that's what Christians do. Uh, these people are, quote, the experts. Mm. One of the uh, people you just brought up is Carl Jung. Jordan mm. Peterson is entirely Jungian. That's his biggest <laughs> influence. A lot of people think Jordan Peterson is great. And yeah, he has a lot of wisdom when he sticks mm -hmm. with what the Bible says and mm -hmm. just upholds just conservative, conserving the biblical worldview. Great. But if anybody thinks he's become a Christian, he's still not. Right. Um, and, and he's not trustworthy because of that Jungian philosophy yes. that under kind of undergirds most of what he says. Yes. Boy, we could pray for him, though. Boy, yeah, I, he know. may be getting closer. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that would be that would just be such a blessing if God would just save him and and uh, yeah. because he's got such a following and you mm -hmm. know he's already preaching out of the Bible. He's just not he's well, he's trying to teach. He's not preaching, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't I don't know him too well, but the little bit that I do, he has a lot of common sense or awareness of the dangers of the left for sure. Sure. Yeah. So how, how does a, how does a Christian deal with psychology? I mean, psychology is dealt. I don't think, I don't think most people are really aware of how uh, entrenched psychology is in our schools and our colleges, all these things like pastor Jeff was just bringing up. I mean, how do we fight against psychology's influence in the culture? Oh, it's uh, pervasive. It's, ev it's everywhere. Uh, even in the language that Christians use when they talk about things like, well, I'm hard, hardwired to do this and, and uh, I'm programmed to do that and talk about uh, in electronics terms or technological terms. Uh, those are borrowed from psychology. Mm -hmm. um, there's, so, there's so many things. And these days, even, even people who are selling cookies are hiring psychologists to know <laughs> how to be more effective at doing that, right? So it, it's, it's really tricky uh, how they work, and we need to be careful about how they use the tools of Satan. Why shouldn't we fight for Christians to be exempt from psychological analysis? Well, we should. I, I, this, this is a major problem. Uh, in fact, so much so, uh, you know, Christians are always wanting to keep the spiritual world from invading the secular world. And to some extent, we agree with that after uh, our escape from Europe and all of the wars between the Catholics and Protestants and all of that. Uh, but now we've become so divided and broken down. And what the secular world wants to do is keep stripping away the spiritual and the moral mm -hmm. away from the church so that we have nothing left to talk about. <laughs> and then they commandeer it with certain authority. But in California, for instance, Governor Newsom uh, has passed laws that strip authority from parents over their own children concerning puberty blockers and having uh, reassignments, surgery. Parents have no authority. So if we don't wake up soon, they are going to take everything from us. Everything. everything. They're, they're in the process now. Uh, the governor in Illinois has just passed a law that it's you, you will be considered a, an abusive parent if you do not aid your children in those things, that, that wickedness. So they, they are coming after us hard, and we're, we're just on the cutting edge of some of that, but it's, it's going to start hitting us hard. And it's already hitting some people and some families where their kids are being taken away from them. I, I hear that. <laughs> mm -hmm. know all about it personally, actually. I actually met a guy in uh, D.C., who spent $1.2 million in Texas trying to prevent his uh, pediatric wife um, from transgenderizing his eight-year-old. Mm -hmm. uh, after about four or five years, she was able to convince a judge to move to California, and we're waiting to see what happens. Well, and, and that's how the world works. Everyone thinks, well, that's just a rare case of a situation I don't know much about. I'm too busy to get involved in all of that. Mm -hmm. But this is uh, um, what, what I call being a worldview squatter. Uh, we have a problem with that too these days, right? Uh, people go, leave their vacation home for a few weeks. Somebody breaks in. Now they own the place and you have to jump through all kinds of hoops to get them out. But, but that's what's happened with psychiatry and psychology. They've asserted authority as if they know so much more than everybody else. 
uh, and they've established themselves as the rightful owner of this domain, the psyche or the mental illness department. Uh, and, and now the church is fighting to get back the authority that we always had. You, you remember the little house on the prairie when people had problems, they went to see the pastor in the town. That, yeah. That's what it used to be, but <laughs> not now. We so a worldview squatter, tell me what that is. What is a worldview squatter? Well, uh, it's it's like what happened this past week with the Roman Catholic football kicker. Mm -hmm. uh, he speaks truth that this country has always believed for hundreds of years. Oh, and they're yeah. going crazy. How can he talk like that? We need to suppress this kind of thing. They act as if they have been in the driver's seat from the beginning. Right. They, they, they were never in the driver's seat. But, but people go, oh, oh, yeah, we better listen to them. <laughs> no, why are we you know what else they do is they borrow the capital from our worldview to make sense of theirs yes so in their atheistic worldview darwinian evolution there is no justice how could there be a standard of justice when there's no god and there's all that's going to be a million years from now in their worldview is just the i guess the the sun would have swallowed up this earth yes and there will be nothing just nothingness so how would there be a sense of right or wrong? What they Correct. do when they, they claim they're advocating for justice for the oppressed, all of that is squatting on our worldview. Sure. Because sure. we have the image of God in man, and so each individual has value. Only yes. they're taking what is our concept of human rights and individual rights and the image of God in man, and they're twisting it for something that's completely contrary to the, the word of God. Yes. So they're squatting on our worldview that way too. I yes, see it. I see a t-shirt coming out soon. This is, <laughs> this is, this is a t-shirt for sure. Well, yeah. they, they, do. They, they, they talk as if they are the authority. They know what they're talking about. This has always been this way. Right. And, and, and people are so ignorant and forgetful that they don't even speak up to that. They just accept it as truth. And we need to be thinking, we need to be, speaking out we need to say that's not the way it is that's that's wrong you know that guy did, did, did you guys either did you notice any of the squishy church commentary on the the, the guy you're talking about i didn't know he's catholic but the guy that spoke the, from the kansas yeah. city chiefs what's his name butcher butker 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 did you notice any of the great church commentary like they said well He's not really uplifting women the way that they should. I got a couple of comments where they're pointing to, to uh, uh, Proverbs 31. And, and I'm like, even our own Christians, you know, a big chunk of our Christians don't understand he wasn't where our worldview enough. comes from. No. He wasn't using enough nuance. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. I, 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 I give him a lot of credit for speaking out, but yes. then people, people are screaming from ESPN to all the, the bobbing heads on TV that to have the NFL sanction him and kick him off the team. And, you know, they're not just worldview squatters, they're stormtroopers. It's, it's awful. It is awful. And, and it, and it's all steeped in, uh, I mean, psychology is one of their big weapons to mm -hmm. to 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 take the worldview. Of, I mean, the only time psychology does any good, I mean, they're they're like a broken clock. They're they're right twice a day, or when they quote the Bible, mm -hmm. plagiarize yeah. the Bible. That's well, the only kind of bad. Place. I'm not sure about that because usually when they quote the Bible, it's out of context and twisted toward a particular goal that I don't agree with. Judge um, not, lest you may be. Judge, there you go. That's the one that that always comes up. We just talked about that recently at church, but, uh, and, and I agree with you, Jeff, entirely, you know, they're constantly stealing biblical concepts, uh, and then twist them. But this is the same crowd that said there is no absolute truth, but now they're telling us that there is absolute truth and it's not what the Bible says. So who said there's psychologists saying there's absolute truth. Tell me more. Well, they're saying every time they say that, uh, homosexual is born this way, even uh, though their studies disprove that. <laughs> so, but you know, we're always putting forth a uh, theory as truth, whether it's evolution or monetary theory or whatever else it is. Uh, and it's contrary to scripture, but you can't argue it and, uh, you're wrong and you're oppressive and, 
and you're judgmental and you're hurting uh, children's images of themselves and their self-esteem and on and on it goes. So, they just say it's settled science. It's settled, settled science. science. Yeah. Yep. So not good. So, um, yeah. So what are the other, so we're, we're tearing down high places. Psychology, completely a high place needs to be torn down. I, I personally think, yeah, I, if we could just extract that out of the culture, that would be horrible. What are some other high places we want to tear down? Cause we had a little email conversation back and forth and you guys were chatting about mm -hmm. a couple other high places. I yield to your interest. <laughs> well, I tell you what. So one of the things they do with psychology, uh, you know, we were talking about the family court where I, I personally was forced to use a psychologist against my will, and they would have taken my gun away if I had one, but I didn't at the time. Second um, Amendment. I knew you were going Second Amendment, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mike, tell us what tell us what the problem is. Why is that a high place? Why why should Christians care about the Second Amendment? Why should we care? Well, the Bible doesn't speak a whole lot to that uh, by means of uh, a numerous amount of scripture, but it does speak to that in prominent ways. Uh, let's think of Esther. Esther, uh, in a time when Haman wanted to destroy the Jewish people and God worked in their behalf. And do you remember the last couple of chapters mm -hmm. in the book of Esther? Uh, when she spoke up for her people, the king said, I can't remember the law of the Medes and Persians. You couldn't change it, but you could make another law. And so the law was given permission to exterminate the Jews, but then he gave another law that the Jews could fight for themselves and defend themselves. And they did. They came together and they vanquished their enemies and by the thousands and uh, saw a great victory. A lot of people forget about those last two chapters. We're just excited that right. Haman got dealt with, but... But that, that was just the beginning of the battle. The, the battle then went into the hands of the people. Uh, or the psalmist, David, saying, Lord, you have prepared my hands for war. Uh, it, it's, it's not something we desire, but Ecclesiastes reminds us there's a time for war and there's a time for peace. And we don't want to fight a war, but what are you going to do if someone comes into your church uh, wanting to shoot up people, you're just going to stand and say that's wrong or are you going to fight to defend them? Why does a shepherd have a staff? Why does he deal with the wolf and the lion and the bear? Why? Why? We're told. And then even to the point of Jesus telling the disciples as he's about to leave them, you've had it pretty easy now. You haven't had to worry about your meals or where we're going to go. And people have hosted me and therefore they hosted you. But I'm leaving and uh, you guys need to make sure that you are thinking about your own pocketbook and uh, making a way uh, to live. And you better have a sword or two. And they said, well, we have two. And Jesus said, that's enough. Let's go. And uh, we need to be careful to make too much of that or too little. But he, he didn't tell them to get cheese graters. He didn't tell them to get butter knives. He told them to get one. swords. Joe, pull that up. Luke twenty two thirty six. People got to see this right from the Lord's mouth himself. He said, from Jesus' mouth, yeah. as he's going to the cross without any protest or battle, because he had to win the spiritual battle first. But he was reminding his disciples, you need to be ready to defend yourself. And that's always been biblical. That's always been right. So, why it's do you think there's such an attack coming from the left against the Second Amendment? What, what's the danger that we're facing with that? Uh, what is the danger? Uh, well, our founding fathers in America were God-fearing men, even though many of them were not God godly men or, or true Christians. They, they believed the Bible had authority over our lives and had much to say. Uh, but they also saw, practically speaking, that through most of history, most of the world, there's always been some kind of weapon control because yep. that gives them tyrannical power. And we see it in the scripture. Before David, uh, in some ways, I think that Jonathan was perhaps an even greater warrior and man than David was. But do you remember the scripture tells us in, in Samuel, says Second Samuel maybe, um, that no one in Israel had a sword except Saul and Jonathan. 
And so they would not allow the blacksmiths to make weapons for the people. Why? Because it kept them subjugated and controlled and surrendered. There, there wasn't much they can do. And then even in that text, it says that they came with their mattocks and their hoes and their uh, the farming equipment. They, they were fighting battles with farming equipment while the Philistines had chariots and swords. And so that's what makes those early battles especially astonishing when Jonathan climbs the cliff, um, which falls right back into the Second Corinthians 10 passage you guys are championing for the name of this, uh, tearing down high places. And he fought the entire Philistine army uh, with only his shield bearer with him. <laughs> I, love that. I love that story when the whole army goes running. I can almost imagine that. The entire Philistine army and chariots are running downhill, and here comes Jonathan swinging his sword behind them. That had to have been one of the funniest moments in history. Um, but but it reminds us, uh, the Philistines knew then, the devil knew then, and he knows now, if you disarm people, then you can control them. And that's why they want to take a weapon, our weapons away. Amen. So, so it's love of neighbors, the bottom line. <laughs> I I'm mean, the Japanese sure. said that they they weren't going to attack here in World War II because yeah. there were too many guns. They're like, that's you'll never, exactly, you'll never win a land exactly war in America. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that there's going to be instant replay in heaven? Like, do you think we'll get to see Jonathan chasing the Philistines? Well, I, I, I can't understand why we wouldn't. Why would the Lord that's not let us see it? Yeah, yeah. If he writes to us about it and, yeah. and that technology was not there then, why would he not let us see it? Yeah. In the future. Well, I think a lot of Christians and myself included think I wouldn't want everything I've ever done to be available for the whole world. To no, see. no. But scripture? <laughs> but, Certainly not. Why not scripture? Right. But Second Corinthians 4, 17 says these light momentary afflictions are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory. So the things that happen here, even our sufferings, accomplish something there. So mm -hmm. it's connected. Hey, Tim, what's up? How you doing? We got to take a moment and greet this guy because he's getting married in uh, two days. Yes. Three days. <laughs> That's Unmute right. Your mic there, buddy. I could hear him from the other room. He said, better yeah. late than never. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mike, Mike Jarrell's on the show. This is probably hey. a great show. How are you, Tim? <laughs> it's been good. It's been good so far. Sorry to interrupt. Pardon the interruption. No yeah. problem. Not at all. Good to have you. <laughs> we just excited, uh, excited, excited for your show. wedding coming up, buddy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Hey, real quick, here's the bride right here. Hey. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Tell her I'll be praying for her. All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. So All right. We had just like taken a little sidetrack that I brought us down about whether there's instant replay in heaven. And uh, me and Mike both think there very well could be. I hope there is because the things that happen here matter. They're not just a race and you start mm -hmm. new, but what happens here matters for there. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah. that all of these things matter. We're probably going to be able to see it, but there won't be any shame because everything will be covered by the blood of Jesus. And we'll recognize right. how even what was evil in this world has worked together for good and it'll bring more glory to God. So we'll, we'll delight in the glory it brings to Christ. But I do think we're going to get to see the, uh, the reruns. Maybe um, there'll be a, uh, maybe there'll yeah. be like a God Center top ten. Like a <laughs> yeah. Well, eternity's a long time, and I think we're going to get to see the full glory of God and all that He did throughout history. Yep. Yep. So it is just opinion, but uh, it's hard for me to imagine why you wouldn't let us see it. And uh, right. it'll be uh, better than virtual reality. You know, we'll, for sure. The Omnimax. We'll we'll get to see it and. And, hey, and it's amazing about the stuff that we already got from him in the word. Yes. So that's right. I, I think that we got to be interested in that before mm -hmm. we're interested in, uh, you know, thinking about the instant replays and stuff. People should really if they're interested in that, they should be interested in what God's word says now and get to well, know who God is. You're 100 percent right, because too often people who want to watch biblical history it's merely entertainment mm -hmm. but when you read it and study it it's for application and for life mm -hmm. and amen you know a lot of people are entertained by biblical stories but 
Uh, I know when we sometimes when there's a, a movie out like Samson a few years ago or whatever, we'll take a group of people to go see it. But it's it's worthless if we don't discuss it afterward. What is it saying? What is it not saying? Where was it biblical or unbiblical? But more importantly, how do we talk about Samson's life and what that means for us? So it's but I'm stunned how many people do not debrief or evaluate or discern or look at things uh, by means of application. Uh, we've, we've been so channeled to be entertained. And that's the danger of TikTok and all that stuff for our kids today, because mm -hmm. I, I even go with them. I used to drive my kids crazy because even when they were growing up, they're in they're around 40 now. But uh, growing up, when we'd watch a movie, I would often pause it and say, whoa, that was big. And they'd go, can we just watch the movie? <laughs> I'd say, no, there was something important that just happened. Did you see it? And uh, it, it's important that we are learning, that we're studying, that we're thinking, that we're discerning. So mm. I'm thinking, Mike, out of the topics that you talked about that were high places, there's probably two you could go to off of what you just said. You could either go down the work ethic route or the parenting route or parenting your children to have a good work ethic that, you know, any of those would probably work. Absolutely. And, and, and we should, but we are in a very strange, a very strange time. And it, it's not hard for the world to steal the parental authority from the church because most Christians have abandoned it in the first place. How many parents are teaching their children in the home instead of punting it to the church to do with children's ministries and junior church. Those are supplemental. Those are support. Parents are supposed to be training their children. That's the, the direct challenge of the Shema, right? Uh, fathers, raise up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. When you're walking along the road, when you rise up and lie down, and yes, the it's to be on your mind and you're to be talking about it with your children. If, and if you don't love the Lord with all your heart, what are you going to teach them? So it, it needs to be a part of you first. Uh, but that parenting of parental authority can't just be kicked away or punted uh, to the school systems, to psychiatrists, even to the church. But that's what most Christian parents do, unfortunately. But well, we hire Christian schools to teach our kids, the church to, to teach our kids, but, they're watching your life even more than all of that. Mm -hmm. But the world, like we said earlier, California, Newsom and the guy in Pritzker is his name, I think, in, in Illinois, they are passing laws literally stripping away the authority of parents. And I, I don't know, would, would we let somebody walk up to our yard and take our kids away? That If, if there, there are a few things that will make me more willing to fight tooth and nail, physical fight, grab a weapon than that. But we're letting our government discern and determine what we can and can't teach our own children by means of our faith and that they can behind our backs, take them to abortion clinics. They've been, we've been letting them do that for years. Now Planned Parenthood is championing behind our backs, giving puberty blockers to our kids. Uh, and now if, if you stand against it, you can be arrested for child abuse in, in Illinois. That's what they're trying to pass. So they are coming fast and hard. And there's talk in some circles where they want to eliminate all home schools and Christian schools too. So wow. it's coming. I think, we, I think we have a front runner for a uh, red pastor of the year, Joe. <laughs> He's on the wrong side of the river. <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's we'll a New Jersey initiative. Territory. We're like the prayer of Jabez. We're going to enlarge our tent pegs and, and bring, <laughs> well, we could, bring we could have him. In. We could have him speak at the Red Church Summit. He could be a oh, speaker for sure. But, he needs to be a I, guest regularly on this show. Ah, yeah, I know. Like but, you, hey, yeah. but I'm confused, Mike. I, I mean, shouldn't we let the government take our children because of Romans 13? I mean, what if they really want them? And they claim authority. They say they're in charge. You got to submit. Got to submit, um, Mike. You have to obey God rather than men, and God established the home before He established the government. And Ooh, that's good. That's that's the essence of it all. It's all right there. And we're gonna we're gonna answer to the Lord for how we raise our children. And you can't be a pastor if you don't manage your household well. That's how important that parental authority is 
And our, not just authority, the, the authority is there because the responsibility is there. Are we taking care of them? Are we providing for them? Are we teaching them? Are we being an example for them? Are we protecting them? Uh, and that's what gives us that authority. But, you know, the government wants to take them and tell them what they can do and say and learn and, and stand against us. But we, that, those are fighting words. I, I, don't, I don't know. That, that's going to be a real struggle if I ever come to that point, what I have to do. But uh, that, that's, that's, I've been called to be a father before an American citizen. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I was sharing with you earlier, Mike, over here in New Jersey, we've got this, uh, this rule that says uh, that when, you know, child abuse is suspected, uh, we're not allowed to tell our pastors if we like, say we had children's church and you're talking about that. We're not allowed to tell the pastor. We're not allowed to tell, um, you know, uh, confront the person. Like it says in Matthew 18, we've got to call child protective services, toll free number right away. Mm. What do you think of that? Well, uh, I think that's dangerous, but we also be, have to be aware of the other extreme. Um, we have a, uh, a detective for the state attorney general's office in Pennsylvania, just as around the corner from me, he's a Roman Catholic, not, not a Christian by our standards and terms, but he and I have become very good friends. And he was on the task force going after all the Roman Catholic priests. They of course took that to the other extreme where they didn't even report what they found to be true. <laughs> that, that That's absurd. So you have the one extreme, um, but uh, we, we should be practicing biblical principles of going to each other and talking to uh, each other first. The, the church, I, I believe the church is above government, uh, ultimately. Uh, but there can be times where we, ha we should be able to work together. And we have for years by means of marriages, for instance, and certifications. And we talked about that a few weeks ago at our cluster. Did you? Uh, sure. Should we have a marriage license or should we get rid of it? Does the church, does the, does the, government have the authority to say you can't get married we we reject your application for a license uh well we're we're coming to that fast because they're going they're going to start probably uh, i can't say this uh, for fact but i believe it's just a matter of years before they strip pastors of their their ability to do wedding and marriage licenses if you're not willing to marry homosexuals and uh, the, the next big thing coming is polyamory. So now you're going to be marrying three or four people at the same time or five people. Uh, and that's already starting to happen in places. It's already happened a couple places. Yeah. Yep. Yep. There's, yeah. There's two, there's two cities, I believe there's one up in new England. that has got polyamory. Mm -hmm. And um, yes. but, uh, did you guys see what happened in Germany recently? I saw you texted something. I didn't get a chance to read it, but you can tell us. Yeah, so Germany decriminalized child porn. Now that now I got I already I already got arguments from the left. They're saying, oh, but they're still putting people in jail for a minimum of 90 days. Well, it used to be a minimum of a year. So it's it's their progressive design to I mean knock it down a peg. Okay, great. You're still putting them in jail, but for 90 days, listen. They, you, you get six months for, for missing a child support payment. You're going to get nine, 90 days for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for, for child porn. Really? So, you know, this is, this is something to watch out for. This is what we all have been saying for the longest time. This is the plus on the end of the alphabet soup, right? It's alphabet soup plus plus. Uh, yeah. What do you think of that? Well, it's already happening, and there's there's some college and university professors who are teaching that this should be accepted now, mm -hmm. uh, and they've renamed it. I can't think of the name right now, uh, the acronym that they have for it. Yeah, it's like um, minor attracted or something. Yes, yes. Minor attracted person. They have legal organizations, that's, that's, NAMBLA. That's, yeah. Did you ever heard yeah, of NAMBLA? Yeah, yeah yes, yes. Uh, psychology's been saying that for some time now, and there there is a move uh, – uh, not a well-known movement, but there's a movement of people trying to make that mainstream and normal. Um, so how it's down the same path as homosexuality and transgenderism and polyamory. I mean, everything goes, which takes us back to 2 Corinthians 10. Um, 
and tearing down high places. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen pictures from Corinth to the Acre Corinth. Uh, I've been blessed to actually visit Corinth years ago. And when it talks about high places, the city of Corinth is down close to sea level, but right above it is a sheer cliff. And at the top of that is where the temple prostitutes would mm -hmm. service the people of the city. Um, and so people would go up there to have uh, sex as they worshiped pagan gods. Uh, and that's interesting picture, isn't it? They've elevated sexual immorality above everything else. And it's, a, it's an incredible thing. And so I've been at Corinth and I've been up at the top at the Acro Corinth. And I don't know how anybody could have scaled that mountain and won a battle. But the, the scripture tells us we can, just like Jonathan, to make full mm. circle. Just like Jonathan climbed that cliff and fought the entire Philistine army. Uh, our weapons are not worldly. Ultimately, we're not trusting in uh, pistols and rifles to win. We're trusting in the Lord. Amen. Amen. Wow. Amen. That's a great place right there to finish it, Joe. You can't beat that. That's oh, gosh. Have we gone that long already? I was having so much fun. Four minutes, bro. Ah. <laughs> Back up right there, that, that sums it up. We, we're trying to tear down high places, but we can't do that in our strength. It's not by mm -hmm. might nor by, by power, but by the Spirit of yep. God. By the, the, the Spirit of God, says the Lord of hosts. So yeah. we have to fight a spiritual battle with spiritual weapons in our mm -hmm. right hand and in our left. Yes. And uh, I'm encouraged to go out and do it because it's not our effort, but God is with us and we are fighting for the, the children of this country mm -hmm. and the, the stakes could not be higher. Yes. So let's, let's get in this battle and let's keep fighting until yes. the battle is won. Even if we have to go scale the Acro Corinth to set some, some children free, yep. let's do it. Do, do a Google search on Corinth and Acro Corinth and look at the pictures. It's, it's pretty yeah. impressive. Wow, definitely. All right, guys. So we're gonna teach Mike the exit exit here. Okay. So if you see a see a brother down at the bottom of the acro corns, <laughs> lift him up. Pick him up. If you see high place at the top of the acro corns, tear it down. Tear it down. Yeah. <laughs>